we're having a multiple side conversations here. Um, thank you for coming out on not such a cold evening, but I'm glad it's not precip precipitating. Um, we want to thank you. I'm going to introduce the gentleman behind me. Uh, but we want to thank you for giving your undivided attention um, to the gentleman on stage and our guest speakers tonight. Please silence your cell phone. My name is Melissa Fowler, and I'm a school counselor here at the high school, and I'm also the chapter advisor for Kyle Cares and Active Minds. Uh, we are the second high school in the state of Maine to have a chapter. Uh, chapters span across the country, and they are in colleges and high schools. Um, and what we stand for is to support and advocate for suicide and mental health awareness. Uh, the first chapter was formed last year in Freeport High School after a student died by suicide. So our message is it's okay not to be okay. And the number of students who are struggling in our district, grades K through 12, around and around the country is growing. Uh, the U.S. healthcare system just simply can't keep up with the demands and um, the community resources are just not available to everyone at the level that is really needed and really required to make a difference. Uh, we know that this generation of adolescents face academic pressures, social expectations, family discord, world events, traumatic events, hormonal changes, and so much more, which can cause stress and anxiety and other mental health issues. Um, so it shouldn't be a surprise that early intervention is key. Um, and first and foremost. So uh, by addressing the mental health issues early on um, and through our group, we're hoping to normalize that it's okay not to be okay, which can help teens develop early coping mechanisms and resilience. Because when they're emotionally and mentally well, um, they're more likely to engage in their studies um, and participate in class more regularly, being able to feel like they're up to academic challenges and achieve better academic outcomes. So the heart of the Kyle Cares Active Mind chapter here at Greeley, we focus on building social skills, fostering positive relationships, providing a safe space for teens to express themselves in a collaborative, safe environment, and without judgment. We also provide resources and programs like this, and one this afternoon, uh, and services that aim to create a really supportive and welcoming school environment. This club is a passion for me, both personally and professionally, and I hope that by spreading awareness and we are helping smash the stigma and creating a safe environment um, so that we can all educate and save some lies. lives. So we have behind me, we have officers. There's a couple who couldn't be here this evening for hockey. Um, Charlie Enemia, who is a co-president. Finn McLean, who is a co-vice president. <laughs> and then we have Sam Anania, who is a co-vice president, and we have Max Allen, who is social media and photography, the head of that. Um, and Charlie and Finn are going to um, talk, talk to you all really quickly before our presenters start. Hello, everyone. Kyle Cares, to me, is about community. A community is best described in the action of a hug. Community is a family that will support each other no matter the circumstances. A community consists of people you know well and those you don't know at all. The commonality is that they appear at unexpected times when there is need and they hold you up when you are at your low. Two years ago, I was at my low. I spent two months in the hospital as I discovered on my 16th birthday that I had a rare genetic lymphatic disorder. While I'm okay now, the result of this diagnosis is that my life as I knew it needed to be altered. I was told I could never pl play contact sports again, and football was my life. During this time, I struggled with my mental health, and I felt helpless. However, I had a community who helped and supported me to get better. When I heard about Kyle at a Maine National Honor Society convention, I learned that Kyle ended his life at 19 years old, and his family started this foundation to honor Kyle's wishes and he left Kyle's wishes that he left for his family to never stop fighting mental illness. I could relate to him, especially during those dark days of recovery. I started to think about how lucky I was to have a community be my safety net. Then my mind wandered to the people who have no help, feel shame, and struggle. I decided then that the, with the help of fellow officers, I would bring a Kyle Cares chapter to my school community to spread mental health awareness and, and welcome and assist people without judgment. 
I'm up here sharing a piece of my story to carry out the mission of Kyle Cares and to show all of you how important it is to smash the stigma of mental health because mental health is serious and we can help each other. And please, if you need a hug, just ask. Thank you, Charlie, that was great. Good evening, everyone. I'm Finn, as Ms. Fowers introduced me. Um, this is a great sight to see after seeing the full sea of like kids earlier, so it's a little less, a little less uh, scary. All right, <laughs> my name is Finn McLean. I'm a senior at Gurley High. I would like to thank the Kyle Johnson Foundation for awarding our Kyle Cares and Active Minds chapter here at Gurley to a grant to be able to bring adolescent mental health speakers to our community today. With that being said, I would like to also thank Mallory, mental health speaker, and Linda Price, educational psychologist, for your presentations on teen mental health and emotional well-being. Earlier today, Mallory presented to our student body about our personal experience, about her personal experience, with perfectionism, depression, anxiety, how she, how she hit her struggles from the adults in her life, and how she eventually developed health coping skills and built resilience. As we know, tonight, Linda will provide will provide caring adults with both a framework to understand how youth experience and respond to stress, worries, anxiety, and other difficult emotions, as well as the tools to be effective and supportive. I'm very grateful to be standing here tonight. As an attendee, we hope that you'll be empowered to support the youth in your life and leave, the ta and leave with tangible skills and resources. I'd like to take this opportunity to speak a little bit about the Kyle Cares and Active Minds chapter here at Greeley High School. First and foremost, I'd like to say that this club at Greeley is the fastest growing club we've ever had to date. We went from only having five members to growing to over 30 members in one month. You may ask, who is Kyle? Kyle lived in Massachusetts, Massachusetts and was known as an outgoing person described as a beacon of light by his friends and family. In 2019, he took his own life. In a final letter written by Kyle the day he took his own life, he stressed the importance of raising awareness for mental health. In that letter, he also encouraged whoever is struggling with mental illness to, to seek help and never stop fighting the disease. When Mr. and Mrs. Johnson read that letter written by Kyle, they wanted to fulfill Kyle's wishes, and soon after his parents created the Kyle Cares Project, or also known as the Kyle Johnson Foundation. Kyle Cares is a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting open and honest communication about the mental health challenges experienced by teens and young adults in today's society. Ultimately, they aim to eliminate student self-harm and suicide by creating school environments where students and their caregivers have the confidence and support to seek help without shame or hesitation. These chapters span across the country and are in both high school and colleges. Currently, there are two schools in the state to have a chapter, and we are more than excited to continue, continue to spread suicide and mental health awareness. To kick off the chapter here at Greeley, the club hosted the Green Bandana Project on World Kindness Day, which was November, th November 13th, along with a pledge poster for students to sign stating, I pledge to be kind, supportive, respectful, positive, and encouraging to my peers, and together, we will smash the mental health stigma and end the silence. That's a good luck right there. <laughs> this project is a program dedicated to preventing suicide, to promoting help-seeking behavior, and increasing awareness of vital mental health resources. Student, partic student participants can proudly attach or display a lime green bandana on their backpack to show this. Greeley students had a choice to pass, pass on this opportunity or to dive in. The awareness event was a su huge success. As to this day, I will still, I will see, uh, sorry, sorry. I still see students with green bandanas tied to their backpacks. We have ordered more bandanas for students and faculty members who did not get a bandana. Our club meets during enrichment time, where it is an open time to talk or a time to plan for more programming events, like having every fall winter athletic team give a short educational awareness speech for a competition. Currently, we are planning our first ever 5K, honoring Kyle that we will be hosting at Greeley High School in April. All proceeds will be given back to the foundation. All this means so much to me because I have never had a platform to comfortably talk about mental illness. Not only have I experienced mental health struggles, but also my closest friends and so many peers at Greeley have, have as well. As an adolescent heading off to college in a few months, I feel that the spreading awareness and confirming that it's okay to not be okay is essential. The statistics are staggering, as suicide is a leading cause of death among college-age students. It is the most prominent factor associated with suicidal behavior in college students is depression, 
and roughly 12% of college students report the occurrence of suicide during their first four years in college. One of my biggest fears is experience that Mr. what Mr. and Mrs. Johnson experienced that day in 2019 when their only son took his own life. It is always nice to know that a peer in the community has your back, even if you don't know them, but they are a safe place to seek help. That's what this club is about. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie, and thank you, Finn. I'm going to move that down because I'm only 5'4". Um, I'd like to now introduce our first guest speaker, Mallory, who is a lifelong competitor in athletics and eventually met an opponent where winning wasn't the objective. She will share her personal experience with perfectionism, depression, and anxiety, how she hid her struggles from the adults in her life, and how she eventually developed healthy coping skills and built resilience. By facing her mental health challenges, Mallory has learned how to be vulnerable and engage in healing. Let's welcome Mallory. Right after this. How, does it sound better with the mic? This way I don't have to scream. How's everyone doing this evening? Good, oh my gosh, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to be here. I have to tell y'all, I go to a lot of schools and do a lot of these presentations, but there was something really special about coming to this particular high school today. The engagement I saw in your students was something I've never seen before. And it's a real honor to go into a school where the buy-in has already happened. That just goes to show the community is doing a lot around mental health and the kids are taking it on. And that to me is the most beautiful thing in the world. So, be, so to be able to be here tonight is something that's really special for me. Um, so I'm gonna introduce first what Minding Your Mind is and then we'll dive into my presentation this evening. So I'm a young adult speaker with Minding Your Mind. It's an organization that uses the stories of young adult speakers so we can have open and honest conversations around mental health. And our main goal is to have these conversations so that we can shatter the stigma that still seems to come up with mental health challenges. So I'm gonna talk about a lot of different topics. Um, and I always like to preface with, I'm gonna be talking about some stuff that might get a little bit heavy. I don't know everyone's stories and backgrounds, what you might be going through, what your family members might be going through or friends in your life. So if there's at any point a time where you feel like, ooh, I need a break from this, I promise you're not gonna hurt my feelings. Please take time to take care of yourselves. That's most important to me. Um, and with that being said, we'll go ahead and get started. So growing up, I just wanted to belong. As the youngest of three and the only girl, I was thrown into a world where I felt I was constantly playing catch up in order to be seen. Now I tried to be as loud and bold as I could be. I wanted to be a part of every conversation and I was quick to make my thoughts and feelings known. I was a tiny human in a very big world and I was determined to take up as much space as possible. To be honest, I think my hair got the memo way before any other part of my body or personality. I mean, y'all can see that hair. The universe was like, yeah, girl, we see you with those big curls. Please learn how to style them. Now also on the screen with my giant hair, my two older brothers, that's Andrew on the left, that's Ross on the right, and that's our childhood dog, Misty, who's the reason we didn't constantly fight each other in our childhood. But despite the bickering, my brothers were my two favorite people on the planet. I wanted to be just like them. I wanted to do what they did, how they did it, and as well as they did it. And since both of my brothers loved and excelled at sports, I also had to love and excel at sports. That's why for as long as I can remember, I have always been an athlete. There I am in my various athletic endeavors, lacrosse, basketball, soccer, you name it, I was competing in it. Now don't let that cheesy smile fool you. I was a smack talking and vicious competitor who was often getting sidelined for penalties or running my mouth, usually talking smack to the person trying to guard me. I had a particularly memorable high school lacrosse game. We were playing our rival high school, coached by my former rec league coach. The whistle blew and I went out and immediately scored a goal. I went on to score two more goals right after that, three goals back to back to back. And as I jogged down the field after that third goal, I heard my former coach yell to his players, is anyone gonna guard Mallory? And with a smirk on my face, I looked him straight in the eye and said, yeah, coach, is anyone gonna guard me? This game is too easy. My parents weren't entirely proud of how much I talked back, but that was just my personality because I was extremely confident. No matter how strong or fast or skilled my opponents were, they never felt too overwhelming to me. That is until I faced a competitor that was a little harder to smack talk. That is until I faced a competitor where winning wasn't the objective. That is until I faced an opponent that didn't exist outside of myself in the form of another player, but instead lived within my mind. It was an opponent you all couldn't see at some point. My greatest opponent wasn't an opponent on the field or on the court. My greatest opponent became my mental health challenges. 
Although I was a really outgoing, very loud kid, I had a lot of big feelings that I hid beneath the surface. Now, usually those big feelings revolved around whatever bothered any young kid, you know, not getting my way, my brothers teasing me, feeling tired or hungry, the usual. But by the time I was four years old, those big feelings started to take shape in a way that wasn't so usual. You see, it started with these nighttime questions. My parents would come tuck me into bed, and as they kissed me goodnight, my little brain began to buzz with a question. Oftentimes, it'd be something like this. Mom, Dad, if I accidentally swallow dirt today, am I going to get sick? It's kind of an odd question to ask, right? Many of my questions had to do with death, dying, and illness. I don't know where the questions came from, but I felt like I had to ask them because how could I possibly sleep if I thought something bad might happen to me? Now, my parents would answer with, no, Mallory, you won't get sick. You're going to be okay. Sleep tight. But there was no sleeping tight. As soon as the door to my bedroom shut and I was alone in the darkness, my thoughts, they wouldn't stop. I would squeeze my eyes shut and try to wait for my heart to stop hammering in my chest. I really hoped sleep would find me so I didn't have to think anymore, but I also feared sleep because what if I didn't wake up the next morning? And this happened almost every night. You see, at the time, I had no idea that what I was experiencing, the thing that was making my world feel too bright, too loud, and my thoughts too overwhelming, had a name. I didn't know the word I needed to tell someone was anxiety. I was struggling with anxiety. So I kept asking those silly nighttime questions in hopes that the answers I was given would make my mind believe I wasn't in danger. Now, by the time I was seven years old, my anxiety took a new form as my thoughts continued to feel so out of control. I started experiencing these things called obsessions and compulsions. Now, for those who haven't heard of or experienced obsessions and compulsions, I like to explain them like being really, really superstitious. Has everyone in here heard the saying, step on a crack, break your mother's back before? Yeah, we've all heard that growing up, the superstition that if you step on a crack, you're going to hurt your mom. So the ritual is avoid stepping on cracks in like the sidewalk, where sometimes people wear lucky jerseys to support their favorite teams in hopes that it'll will them to victory. I've done this with very mixed success in my life. But these are all superstitions and rituals that people have that are really, really common. But my version of this growing up was washing my hands over and over again. You see, I thought if my hands were clean, I wouldn't get sick and I wouldn't die. And I had these strict rules and rituals around washing my hands, like how many times I had to wash them or for how long I had to wash them. Now, the rules had absolutely no rhyme or reason to them. It was simply what felt right to me. I would have this intrusive or unwanted thought and I would obsess over it. Then I'd go wash my hands according to the rules I made up. I'd usually feel some relief after washing my hands and if I didn't get sick that day, I used it as proof to show this was keeping me safe. Until the next time I had one of those intrusive thoughts and the cycle would begin all over again. I thought the more I washed my hands, the better off I would be. I wouldn't ever get sick or die as long as I washed my hands. Now, deep down, something about that didn't feel quite right. It felt super extreme. But I thought I was keeping myself alive by doing this one thing, and nobody was asking me questions about how often I was washing my hands. If I said it was for my physical health. When those obsessions and compulsions started to get in the way of me living my life, that's when I really crossed that line from superstitious to having obsessive compulsive disorder, or OCD. Now, those obsessions and compulsions continued throughout elementary school until my anxiety was given something else to become focused on. When I was in the fourth grade, I was brought in for a checkup where my doctor told me I was overweight. Now, I had never once thought about my body in the space it took up. I mean, my mind was occupied with more important things. Mostly, how was I going to beat my neighborhood friends in one-on-one basketball when we came outside to play? Though, you all can see me. I'm not very tall, so that really didn't happen for me. But I didn't have time to think about my body. However, as I sat in my doctor's office, he went over all the details with my mom and myself. I can't tell y'all anything he said in that meeting outside of this one part where he paused and gently said, you're overweight. I know you're an active kid, so we probably need to watch what you're eating a little more closely. I blocked out the rest of the conversation. I mean, before that conversation, I didn't know people had strong feelings about the size of their bodies. But in that office, I felt a whole lot of shame burn through me. He told me my body was too big. He made it sound like something wasn't right with me, even if he tried to use a gentle tone as he said it. I did take his advice, though, when I went home and started restricting the foods I was eating and labeling them as good or bad. I labeled desserts as bad foods and told myself I shouldn't eat them. I worried if I ate them, I would not only gain weight, but I'd also make myself sick. You see, around this time, my grandmother had passed away due to heart health-related complications, so I thought if I could just control what I was eating, I'd keep the weight off, keep my doctor happy, and keep myself from developing any heart health issues of my own. 
this dessert restriction really tied together all the anxieties of my childhood, weight gain, sickness, and death, and it gave me hope that if I could just control what I was eating, I'd keep myself small, healthy, and alive. And I so desperately wanted to feel like I was in control over something, anything in my life. So much so that by the time I entered middle school, when I was with friends, I'd be careful to look at what they were eating and how much they were eating to determine how much I should eat. Let me repeat that. I was looking at what other people ate to determine how much I should eat, not listening to my body, not listening to myself, looking outside of myself to determine my hunger level. But honestly, I just wanted to feel good about myself. I just wanted to feel like people liked me. And after hearing the judgment, feeling the judgment from those around me about my size, I thought people would only like me if I was smaller than I was. So I chose to control how much I ate in order to make other people like me. However, the more I tried to control my food, the less control I had over how I felt about myself. And the truth was I didn't like myself. In fact, I hated myself. I thought it was one of the worst people who has ever lived. And I told myself that every day. I said all kinds of terrible things about myself. You're stupid. You're ugly. You're worthless. Nobody likes you. Those were just some of the thoughts that repeated in my head, all of them not really true and all of them super, super mean. But I feel like everyone can understand this at least to some extent. We've all been out in the world. A lot of us are on social media. We all know what it feels like to have our worth determined by how other people see us. I mean, when people say nice things about us, let's be honest, it feels good. But when people say hurtful things about us, it can really take a toll on us. And look, everybody's insecurity is different. Maybe it's not the, your weight. Maybe it's something else with your physical appearance, how, how much money you make, whatever it may be. We've all probably felt like we've come up short compared to those around us. We've all probably spent time comparing our looks and lives to the looks and lives of people we may see in the media or people we know in our everyday life. Though it's not fun or good to do so, everybody often compares themselves to other people. That's not really abnormal. The problem comes when we take in that feeling of not enough and let it completely consume us. It goes from this insecurity we're able to work through to a real threat to our mental health. And all these years of unchecked anxiety was definitely beginning to threaten mine. So what does someone do if they're dealing with these intense feelings of anxiety? I have two favorite tips that I wish I knew back when I didn't know what to do with my anxiety. Now, the first one is to do something called a brain dump, and that's writing down everything that's going on in my head and getting it onto paper. This way, it's not crowding up my headspace, and I'm able to return to it during a time I'm actually able to work through it. So, for example, I'm someone who wakes up at 2 or 3 in the morning pretty often with my thoughts just absolutely racing. And instead of grabbing my phone and scrolling through it, knowing that's not what's going to help me fall back asleep any faster, I actually have a journal I keep by my bedside. I write down all the thoughts that I'm having. And I close that journal as a physical signal in my brain that we're done thinking about those thoughts for right now. They're safe in that journal. But we'll deal with them in the morning when we're more awake, alert, and able to, usually after my first cup of coffee. And my other favorite tip is to find a way to get into your body and out of your head. All right? What does this even look like? What does this even mean? This looks like focusing on how you're physically feeling or movement in the body instead of the thoughts going on in your mind. Because you can't think about something and feel something at the same time. So for example, I'm gonna have us all do something now that's gonna feel kind of ridiculous, but I made the students do it today, so we're also gonna do it here. Can we all do that thing where we rub our stomachs and pat our heads? And I know it feels very silly. Oh my gosh, this is excellent. Oh, I wish I had two hands. Fantastic, and then can you switch and go the opposite direction? <laughs> that's the way that usually trips everyone up. Y'all did good with that. I am deeply impressed. This is a very talented community. And I didn't do that just to make you look silly. I did it for a reason. And the reason I had you do that is because while you're doing that motion, you have to kind of be paying attention to what your hands are doing. So you're likely not thinking about anything else. Your brain's not great at doing both things. It's pretty bad at multitasking. So getting into our body doesn't have to look like doing that. But y'all were good at it, so maybe you want to. But it can look like going for a walk or a run or what I used to do, shoot lacrosse goals as hard as I possibly could. It can also look like wrapping yourself in a blanket or taking a really hot or really cold shower. By focusing on physical sensations or movement in the body, it can actually slow down that train of anxious thoughts. Y'all, here's the thing about anxiety. It has a go-to buddy, a teammate of sorts that it hangs out with, that it confides in, that it feels connected to, and it's really good buddy. It's depression. We, they often go hand in hand because it can be so damn depressing to feel anxious all the time. And as I entered high school, my anxiety decided to tag in its teammate depression for me to compete against. 
an opponent I was not prepared for. You see, I didn't know how to face these opponents. I didn't know how to beat them, so I ran from them and just refused to show up. Instead, I began pretending. I put on this mask that said, I'm fine, I'm good, I'm happy, because that's what I thought I was supposed to be. But the summer before my sophomore year of high school, that mask I wore of I'm fine, I'm good, I'm happy, became so much heavier. And with that heaviness, it became a whole lot harder to actually pretend that I was fine. You see, I started to feel this pit in my stomach, leaving me feeling nauseous all the time. I constantly felt out of it, like I was physically present, but mentally checked out. Sometimes I would look in the mirror and have trouble recognizing the face looking back at me. It was as if all the joy had drained from my face and a permanent frown was left in its place. I didn't enjoy a lot of the activities I did before. Things like smiling and joking around with my friends felt pointless. In fact, I barely spoke. The joyful sound of my voice, the one everyone from my childhood knew me by, had faded until my voice barely existed at all. At some point, I stopped speaking altogether. Every day felt like a drag. I couldn't wait to get home and get into bed so I didn't have to pretend I was okay for other people, but it was an invisible pain you couldn't see, and therefore it almost didn't feel like it was real or worth talking about. So in order to cope with some of that pain, I started using something called self-harm. Now, self-harm is inflicting harm onto ourselves in order to regulate our emotional well-being. Now, oftentimes, people use self-harm because they feel the pain they're inflicting is better than feeling nothing at all. Sometimes it's a way to help manage our emotions. Sometimes, and in my case, self-harm was a way for me to make that invisible pain something I could see and point to to say, this hurts. Now, when I started using self-harm, I felt what I call hollow relief. There was a brief period of time where I felt better, having found a way to finally manage my emotions, but it was always short-lived, and afterward, the pain only felt bigger and more difficult to manage. Self-harm never dealt with the emotions or circumstances I was facing, so it never truly made me feel better. I so badly wanted to ask for help, but I couldn't seem to find the words or the courage. Instead, I had a song that hit me really deep, so one night I posted these lyrics to my social media. Don't know what I'm going through, but I keep on going through changes. And I remember thinking to myself, I had never felt more understood by a song in my entire life. Now, those 13 words caught the eye of someone I went to high school with. Maddie was a year older than me, and she reached out immediately after I posted that. She said she had been through a difficult time the year before, and if I wanted to talk, she would listen. And I remember thanking her for reaching out. That was very nice of her. But I denied that anything was going on. You see, I was raised as a tough kid. I was raised as a fighter, a competitor, and I felt weak for needing to rely on someone to help me through a pain you couldn't even see. But she didn't give up. She reached out two more times, and when Maddie reached out that third time, I decided to talk to her because I wasn't finding any relief on my own. Now, Maddie became the only person I spoke to about anything real during that time. If anybody else asked me how I was doing, I lied. I became a really, really good liar. If someone outside of Maddie asked me how I was feeling, I'd plaster a smile on my face, look them straight in the eye, and say I was doing just fine. I so deeply feared that people would judge me, would find me weak, would think that I was looking for attention, that I wouldn't give them the satisfaction of knowing the truth. I didn't let them know the truth because I had my pride on the line. I had an image to maintain. But if I could go back in time, I'd wound my pride over and over again if it meant I would have gotten help sooner. Looking back, it'd be like me trying to win an entire game without ever passing to another teammate. It's okay and often necessary to ask other people for help. But after several months of only relying on Maddie and my not very helpful coping strategy of self-harm, I started having thoughts of suicide. Now, it wasn't this one moment I can pick out and say, and that's the moment I wanted to end my life. It was months and honestly years of dealing with emotional pain on my own and I just felt exhausted. It's like I was climbing up a mountain with a bag of rocks on my back and I just didn't want to keep climbing anymore. I started thinking about suicide as a way to tell myself there was a way out I didn't always have to hurt. I could make it stop. You see, it's not that I wanted to die. I just couldn't figure out how to cope with the pain I was in. Now, initially, it was passing thoughts, and then it started to become more serious thoughts, and then it turned into me writing this note to my family and friends, apologizing to them. I actually still have that note tucked into my desk drawer at home to remind myself of how far I've come, but at that time, I felt as though I had nothing else left to give. 
thought people would be better off without me. I thought it would be better to just make that pain stop than to have to keep going knowing I felt the way I did. And that's when Maddie stepped in. And she made a really, really hard decision on my behalf. You see, she found out about the suicidal ideation and felt she could no longer keep this to herself. So she came over on Christmas Day during my sophomore year of high school to let me know I had two options. She would either sit with me in a room as we called my parents in and told them what was going on together, or I could wait outside that room and send my parents in while she told them what was going on by herself. She said she would not leave until they knew. Now this is the part in the story where people often ask me if I was mad at Maddie for this, and I absolutely was. I was furious with her. It felt like she was betraying the trust I had given her, but that anger only lasted so long. At the end of the day, she was doing something for me, the thing I couldn't quite do, which was to ask for help. You see, Maddie knew something I didn't. It's better to lose a friendship than to lose a friend. She was willing to lose our friendship if it meant I would still physically be here. Now, ever since that day, I've texted Maddie on Christmas Day to thank her. On the screen here, you'll see these are actual texts from this past Christmas, 13 years to the day she saved my life. Now, if you can't see it, I tell Maddie I love her in a very sappy text message, so it's clear I'm definitely not mad at her. And I thank her for giving me a second chance at life. And Maddie ends her text saying, never stop fighting for those who don't have a voice. But to be quite honest, on that day, Maddie was the voice that I did not have, and I am forever grateful that she chose to use it on my behalf. Now about an hour after Maddie spoke to my parents, they took me to an emergency room where I spoke with hospital staff about what I was going through. And as we sat in the emergency room, my parents were making phone calls, canceling plans with family friends for that evening. And when I asked my mom what she told people about why we wouldn't be there that night for Christmas, she said, I told them the truth. I have to be honest with all of you. I felt a lot of things in that moment after she said that. I mean, I felt a whole lot of relief that she wasn't ashamed of me or what I was going through. But I also had this fear that people would look at me differently now. Maybe they would pity me. Maybe they would fear me. Maybe they would underestimate what I was even capable of doing with my life. I honestly wasn't sure how people would react to what I was going through. But it felt like I entered that hospital as one version of Mallory. And from that moment forward, a new version of Mallory was born. For better or worse, it felt like my life might never be the same. Now we sat in that emergency room for about eight hours before I was moved to a psychiatric hospital. Psychiatric hospital, as we all know, just a hospital specifically dedicated to treating mental health challenges. But at the time, psychiatric hospital was a really scary term for me. My only understanding of these hospitals was from movies and TV shows. So as far as I knew, I was either about to enter some sort of haunted horror hospital and be haunted by something truly terrifying, plot line of a lot of scary movies I watched, or the other plot line they seemed to give it was that I'd fall madly in love with another patient, which is arguably the better of the two plot lines if I had to choose one. <laughs> but neither of those things happened. What actually happened, I got to meet people who were experiencing the same things I was going through. And for the first time, I was given the space to talk to them about these things. I learned talking about these things was okay. In fact, that was all a part of the healing process. But if I was being completely honest with myself, I still wasn't quite ready to look my opponent in the face. I knew there were people who were rooting for me from the sidelines who weren't afraid to show up and be there for me, but I wasn't quite ready to show up and be there for myself. And even though I wasn't quite ready, I did complete that first day in the hospital where I went through group therapy and individual therapy and family therapy. And I started this dose of medication to get me back to a baseline level where I could function and take part in my treatment. And I honestly thought I was good to go. I thought I'd never have to focus on my mental health again. But that's like me saying I ran one mile one time and now I'd be ready to run a whole marathon. It's just not going to happen. In order to maintain good mental health, I had to keep practicing the things I was learning in treatment. I had to keep showing up to appointments and doing the work. Just like any sport I ever played, in order to get better, I'd go to practice and listen to my coaches. And it was kind of the same for my treatment. And it was hard work, work I didn't always want to do. It's not that I didn't want to feel better. I just didn't always know if I'd be understood. I didn't always have the energy to explain what was going on in my head. I just really couldn't seem to find my voice again. But I didn't stop trying to find that voice. I continued in treatment throughout high school. I made it to my graduation, and I managed to grab an acceptance at Northeastern University in Boston. Now it'd be my first time leaving home and attempting to manage my mental health on my own, but I was so excited. 
this was the fresh start that I was looking for. I was ready to get out of my small hometown where it felt like everybody knew my business. I wanted to go somewhere new, be someone new. I'm going to let y'all in on a little secret here. Uh, just because I was a person who wasn't really hiding my mental health challenges from the whole world doesn't mean I was actively taking part in any of my treatment. And I honestly hadn't set up any support for myself for when I got to Boston. So since I follow me wherever I go, the only thing that was about to be fresh and new were my surroundings. My mental health still wasn't in a great place, and I was about to enter some very new territory. So I'm sure we can all guess here, this didn't go particularly well for me. I think sometimes we hope when we transition into new places, things are magically gonna get better. We'll be able to leave our past behind. But if we're not doing the things that take care of ourselves, that stuff just follows us wherever we go. So I left home struggling with my mental health and not really dealing with it. And I went to school and still struggled with my mental health. I struggled with everything. I was anxious about making new friends, anxious about navigating my way through a new city. I'm terrible with directions and got lost literally everywhere that I went. I was anxious about the classes I was taking. I took some class called Math Logic, which to this day I can't tell any of you what Math Logic is or how I eked out a very barely passing grade. And I was having trouble taking care of myself. I was having trouble motivating myself to get out of bed, having trouble remembering to do those everyday things like eat or take my medicine or just go outside and get some fresh air. All of these were signs that my depression and anxiety were definitely still around. And just when I thought my depression and anxiety would truly swallow me whole this time, I was sexually assaulted. And I was walking back to my dorm after meeting a friend for dinner when it happened and it all happened so fast. There were so many thoughts running through my head as the situation escalated of how to break free, but it felt like I couldn't pick a thought to follow through on. My thoughts were moving both somehow too fast and too slow. And even if I had picked a thought to follow through on, I felt like it wouldn't matter anyway because my body was frozen in place. We often all hear about the fight or flight response where a person either runs away or fights back to escape from any traumatic situation, but there's that other response called the freeze response where our body shuts down as a measure of protection. My body really stopped responding to my brain and I was unable to fight back or run away. Now after that encounter ended, I was walking home with my head hung low and this feeling of disgust pulsing through me and I couldn't help but look around me, fearful of what had become my everyday sights and sounds. Every noise startled me, every person felt like a threat. The city I called home no longer felt like home because that night something was taken from me. My sense of safety and the lingering effects of this lasted well past me being safely tucked into my bed in my dorm room. In fact, in the following weeks, I rarely left that dorm room, whether it was just to go to class or just to go to the mini grocery store situated across the path about 50 feet from my building. If I did go outside, I'd be careful to look over my shoulder every three steps I took. I only went out when it was light out and practically sprinted home at the first sign of the sunset. I rarely went out to see friends because I was worried if everyone saw what a bummer I was, they wouldn't like me and that felt way too vulnerable. This isolation left me feeling really lonely, and the more alone I felt, the more worthless I felt, and the more worthless I felt, the more I thought about suicide again. But this time, I wasn't around the people who would help me into treatment if I was struggling. I was in a new city. I didn't know that many people that well. And every time I picked up the phone and called home, I told my parents I was doing just fine because I didn't want to disappoint them. So this time, it came down to me. This time, I had a choice. Now I thought back to sitting in my house with Maddie a couple years earlier and the two options she gave me. So as I sat in my dorm room, I said to myself, look, Mallory, you have two options here. You can either choose to give treatment another chance and really give it your all this time, or you could end your life. And I don't know exactly what it was. I think it was that competitor in me, that fighter in me that wasn't ready to give up right then and there. As much pain as I was in, I thought it might be worth one last shot to give treatment one more chance. Be like me throwing up a half court shot in basketball right before the buzzer goes off signaling game over. Never hurts to at least try. I've seen that shot go in sometimes. So that's exactly what I did. I walked myself to an emergency room and explained I was struggling with suicidal ideation. And it was the first time I chose treatment for myself. Nobody forced me to go. Nobody carried me there kicking and screaming. I decided. I decided I was really ready to take part in my own healing and saying those two words, suicidal ideation, to the hospital worker who asked me what brought me in that evening, changed everything. Because for the first time, I felt like I was able to stand up to my greatest opponent, my mental health challenges.
Now, for me, at that moment in my life, choosing to get help made me feel strong. Instead of fighting being in treatment or shying away from being vulnerable and willing to share the experiences and emotions I'd hidden behind that mask of just being fine, I really let myself dig into the process. My self-care became the most important thing to me. Now, self-care is frequently talked about, but sometimes only certain aspects of it. Self-care is so many things. It's all about doing the things that make you feel well. So my self-care has looked like weekly therapy with a therapist who really holds space for me to work through my emotions at my own pace, but who also really pushes me to find new and creative ways to express my emotions, like through drawing or collaging, two activities I'm really not skilled in at all, but we seem to do them every single week. And I don't think it's because my therapist is trying to get on my nerves or roast my artistic abilities. I think it's likely for two reasons. Now, one of those reasons is she keeps telling me I can't keep getting tattoos as markers of my recovery, though I disagree and have my next one planned, but it's an ongoing conversation between her and I. At, she's right at some point, I'll have to find some other coping skill besides inking my body, I'll run out of space. I think my mom would likely agree with her as well. But realistically, she's probably trying to teach me that I don't need to be perfect. I don't even need to be good at everything that I do. It's okay to just learn and grow in a process and have that be good enough. My self-care has also looked like finding ways to move my body that feel good for me without worrying about weight loss or calories burned. I hike, I do Pilates. I'm a pretty good dancer, but I'm not gonna break it down for you all this evening. And I am working on doing my first ever pull-up, which I'm super excited about. I'll let you all know when I finally get my chin above that bar, but it's, it's likely gonna be a while. Those are my things though. You might have completely different things. Maybe you like to just go for walks with your friends, take some sort, sort of exercise course, whatever it may be. Movement releases endorphins, it makes us feel good. It can help release stress, trauma, or anxiety that might be stored in the body. With that being said, sometimes we can't move around to release those things. And I've found that meditation and mindfulness have been super helpful tools, but I feel like sometimes it gets a bad reputation. I feel like people sometimes think it's, you have to sit in a yoga pose for an hour and breathe, which you certainly can, but that's not always how it has to be. So I'm gonna give us a real life example of how to use mindfulness in a way that I need to learn how to use it in my everyday life. Now, I imagine a lot of us here are drivers. We've all driven in, in a car before, or we've been you know, the passenger, whatever it may be. And I'm not originally from the New England area. And upon moving up here, what I learned is, so sorry, but y'all are some of the worst drivers I've seen in my entire life. Where I'm from in Massachusetts, they call them mass holes. And I know that on any one of my drives, someone's gonna cut me off and it's really gonna piss me off. But instead of laying on my horn unnecessarily long, which is a thing people do in this area, I promise I heard you after the first second or flipping off the driver that's passing me, which is my knee jerk reaction. I blame my father for that. But I've learned that it emotionally lasts for 90 seconds, minute and a half. So if I'm willing to breathe through some of that anger, I'll be able to move through it in a way that's not gonna be destructive. And I found this helpful in a lot of areas in my life, taking a step back, taking a beat, before I say or do something that I'm probably gonna regret. And my current favorite breathing technique that I actually use when I'm stuck in traffic or someone's tailgating behind me, which happened on my way up here this morning, it's called box breathing and it's very simple. It's four counts in, hold for four counts, four counts out, hold for four counts makes a nice little visual of a box and between that and the breathing scientifically it actually helps calm you down but I think the best thing I ever found for my own self-care was giving purpose and meaning to my pain and for me that was taking my story and sharing it with other people to hopefully help them along their journey about six months after I brought myself to that emergency room I was working as an intern in a psychiatric hospital when I was once a patient in and I went to thank one of my group leaders Miss Doreen for believing in me when I didn't believe in myself and through the tears of joy and hugs of our reunion, she asked if I'd be willing to come back and speak to her current patients. I said yes without hesitating for a moment. No, I didn't prepare a single word I was going to say for that talk, which we all know is never how anyone should walk into a presentation. But I did go in there and speak from the heart for about 20 minutes. And I remember I left the hospital grinning ear to ear because it was only a few years before that that I was sitting in that same hospital, in those same seats, in complete silence, refusing to talk to anyone. And there I was speaking for 20 minutes straight. I remember it was raining as I left the hospital and I dorkily danced in it all the way back to my car because my pain finally had a purpose in my voice, but my voice was definitely back. And look, I used to ask why me a lot? Why do I have to go through all of this? Why am I so anxious all the time? Why can't I stop washing my hands? Why am I so mean to my body? Why is depression making my life feel so unenjoyable? Why was I sexually assaulted? Why can't I feel safe in my own body? But when I started speaking and writing about my experiences, what I realized was that I needed someone to tell me it was okay to not be okay and that help and healing are out there. They do exist. To which I now say, why not me? 
Now today, I'm still a super competitive person, but I try to save my competitive energy for game nights with my family and friends, which are honestly far too competitive. I really did show up to a game night wearing eye black under my eyes. No one has taught me how to chill out a little bit yet. Attempting to keep up with my friend Nate down the various slopes he takes me on, though I'm not a particularly good skier, and he thinks it's funny to take me down the hardest slopes that there are, so it's really more falling down a mountain for me than skiing, but if that's what I have to do to keep up with him, that's what I'll do and supporting my Baltimore Ravens during football season. And I say that always knowing I live in New England now, usually surrounded by Pats fans. Um, we were supposed to be in the Super Bowl to this weekend, so really just let me have this moment to grieve the fact that we are not. But I no longer feel the need to compete against or beat my mental health challenges. I've come to accept myself for who I am and live fully as myself, mental health challenges and all. And that doesn't mean I don't still struggle today. There are times where I do, but I've learned to use those tools and skills I've gained along the way so that when I do struggle, it's not for nearly as long and I don't reach that crisis point before getting help. And that's really what I wanna wrap up here with today is the idea that it's okay to get help when we are struggling and we don't need to wait until things are really, really bad to do so. If things are starting to feel off, we gotta let someone know. Just like you wouldn't wait to get help for a broken leg, you don't need to wait to get help for your mind. It is just another part of you. My brother Ross says this in a way that I really love. He says he goes to the gym to work out and get physically strong and he goes to therapy to work out and get mentally strong. And I love that concept because it reminds us that talking to someone's not a weakness, helps us learn and grow and be the best version of ourselves. Don't be afraid to reach out and get yourself help if you ever find yourself needing it because you all deserve to feel good and you absolutely deserve to heal. Thank you all so much for having me here tonight. That's for you. Sure, yeah. Thank you, you're amazing. Thank you. I hope y'all win tonight. <laughs> Thank you. I love them. These are awesome kids. Um, so while Linda's, my colleague here, is going to set up her presentation really quick, I'm going to open it up for questions if anyone has any. I know I threw a lot of information at you, um, but we'll do some questions if anyone has any. That's fine. I'm going to hand the mic over to you. Okay. Hello. It's so good to be here tonight. I am going to um, have a slideshow that's a little bit longer than the time we have, so I may go through a couple um, because I think Mallory did such a great job explaining so many parts of mental health. So if you're wondering why I'm clicking through, I just wanted to try to get to some of the strategies as well. Um, so let's see. We're going to talk about it tonight. Um, so I'm a licensed educational psychologist. I've been in the schools for years as a school psychologist and a school counselor. Um, and now I have a private practice in Situate, Massachusetts. I see you know, kindergarten all the way up through college. So I've been seeing students. I've been doing this for 30 years. Um, and so I will say though, COVID, right? We know that the mental health crisis has increased. And right now after COVID, I'm getting so many referrals. So unfortunately there's um, increased needs, increased stress, increase anxiety and depression. And so I'm just, you know, wanting to continue this work with Minding Your Mind, which I love because I can reach, you know, more people, more students and really talk about what can we do. <laughs> um, and so we know that um, we're going to talk a little bit about the fact that I, when I was younger, people weren't talking about mental health at all. And so even just having young adult speakers and people breaking the stigma, we've come a long way. And so I feel like students are even open about all sorts of struggles they're having when I was in the schools. And I thought this is improvement. So there, you know, it's nice that we're starting with hope that there's more focus on mental health. Um, so when we think about our brain development, teens, you know, are more likely to maybe seek rewards, maybe re misread social cues, have strong emotions and reactions, and struggle with complex decision making. Um, teens are less likely, right, to take long-term consequences seriously. They consider the alternatives not all the time. Um, sometimes we don't plan ahead or think ahead. We might be looking for that dopamine rush, which is like that thrill-seeking. That's typical for teens. Um, we also might, you know, have some unrisky or unsafe behavior, and we might be viewed, we do not want to be viewed as different. 
you know, middle schoolers. I don't know if anyone in here, raise your hand if you loved middle school. <laughs> I have yet to find somebody that says they loved middle school, and I tell the middle school students I work with because I have so many students who are teased or bullied or just feel really insecure about who they are in middle school, especially. And I think, you know, I say to them, hurt people hurt people, right? And so sometimes just understanding that it's just a hard age and things get better. And I find by high school, students are more um, focused on, you know, their activities and their passions. And you can find like-minded people that share your interests and share your experiences. And hopefully, you know, some of those teasers or people who did some bullying are actually at a place where they've matured and are leaving you alone. And that's my experience in working with middle school versus high school. Um, and so that, you know, that's really just um, something that I've noticed. Um, but mental health, we all have it, right? It's a continuum. It's never too late or too early to get support. And so I love following Mallory because she has such great examples and such a great way of speaking about the journey that, you know, if we can get people proactive help, right, it goes a long way. And for us all to know that, you know, it's never... Um, too late <laughs> to, to reach out. And I think it can get tricky to find support right now because I think there's more need than there are therapists. <laughs> um, and so that's kind of the reality. But even just kind of finding community, friends, you know, talking to other people, um, other parents is really important. The fact that you're here tonight, I mean, to pat yourselves on the back. It takes a lot to come at this time of night in your busy schedules. So I am just recognizing that. Um, and so we know that we all have stress, right? It doesn't matter. I wish I had a magic wand and I could say, I'm gonna get rid of everybody's stress tonight and you'll never have to face it again. Unfortunately, that's not how it works. And so we all have it. What stresses me out might be different than what stresses you out. And same for our kids. Um, and so we know that these are just some examples of different stressors. I will say, you know, there's really positives of technology, for example, in social media. Um, there is a lot of information out there on social media that's talking about mental health that I think can be really positive. It's kind of sifting through that. But I have a lot of teenagers, especially high schoolers, who have started saying to me, I don't feel good after I do that scrolling. I don't feel like I'm getting the things done that I need to get done for homework. It's getting me distracted. I'm getting sidetracked, right? I mean, we know that in our own lives. And so that's like one of those stressors that it almost feels like an addiction sometimes. And so I work with teenagers who are really wanting to try to find more balance in their lives. And so, you know, we kind of talk about strategies for when you get home from school and like, can you just get started on your homework and put that phone down, you know, and time yourself for 20 minutes and just focus for those 20 minutes without a tech, any phones or anything, you know, and so we talk about how to do that. And then you can reward yourself when you're done and maybe spend some time talking to some friends or doing something that really brings you pleasure. And I'm finding the students that I'm working with around that, they feel much better. And so, you know, those are one of those stressors that we have to work through. How do we find balance so it's not too much? But obviously there's a lot of academic pressures. We know there's a lot that kids have to do working, you know, going to school, getting all their work done. Um, and so again, we also have these stressors that come up day to day, but we have this other thing called a stress response. And it's an automatic physiological wiring in our brain that goes back to the caveman days, right? And so um, if I was a caveman and I had to, you know, saw a saber-toothed tiger coming at me, I would have had to decide, do I fight it? Do I run and hope it doesn't catch me? Or do I freeze and hope it doesn't see me? Mallory touched on that with her trauma. And so we don't know in a trauma situation which one will happen, but honestly on a day-to-day, Right, when we get in the stress response, like I see students in school, right, who, you know, I think about, I worked at an elementary school last, and there was a fourth grader who was under their desk every time they were doing writing. And so when I'd go into the classroom, the teacher's like, they're refusing. And in my mind, I'm like, 
hmm, you know, this is obviously really hard. I took them out for a little walk around the hall without any words, because what we know is less words are better in that kind of elevated, escalated, dysregulated kind of state. And then that child would go back and actually be able to do some writing. It taught us that maybe writing was hard, maybe that child needed some more intervention in writing and support, but it also told us that maybe they were sort of in that stuck mode, just frozen and needed to shift gears. Because what I tell people is that we need to calm that emotional brain before we can get back to our thinking brain. And so this is just another way of thinking and understanding stress. We also know that a lot of times we avoid the things that are stressful. And with anxiety, that's really typical, right? And so whether it's stress or anxiety, flight is a big thing where we're avoiding. We're just not able to face the things that are challenging in the moment. I mean, I think about, you know, if you have a couple hard emails, you know, you think, oh, I'll get back to that later, and then later never really comes, right? It's hard to kind of open that up and do that email, for example. There's a lot of things. I have a lot of students that end up in the nurse's office or in the bathroom, and they're there for much longer because it's like they're in, like, math is really hard, or there's, like, another student sitting next to me that I feel really awkward about, and I, like, don't know how to talk to them, and I'm feeling that social anxiety. So there's a lot of reasons where we might do that flight. Fight is like one that I say to parents especially. Sometimes it's not always personal, right? If our kids are under a great deal of stress, they might argue because they're always safest at home. They feel the most comfortable at home with you. And so they'll argue with you. They'll act out. They'll yell. You'll see the worst behavior sometimes, whereas like, you know, they might be just really little angels in school, but they come home, and I think about that shaken soda can, right, analogy, where it's like they've kept it inside all day, and then they walk in the door, and it's like you ask them to put their shoes in the closet, and it's like, doop, choo, and that soda can erupts, right? There's this big reaction over this small little request, and that can happen, um, and that might be the fight mode, and so again, they might be hurting, but not trying to hurt you, and so sometimes we know about these things and then we think, okay, maybe this isn't personal. Um, and fawn is one we don't talk about very often. It's that perfectionist, again, what Mallory, you know, was talking about, needing everything to be just right, saying yes. Think about yourself sometimes, you're saying yes to everything, whether you want to or not. And that can be the fawn response where it's like people pleasing, but then we're pleasing everybody else, but we're not pleasing ourselves. And so again, finding a balance of giving and receiving. And I think about, you know, as far as parenting and co caregivers, you know, we have to think about like when we're on the airplane and they say if you need to put on your oxygen mask, put on your oxygen mask first before helping somebody that needs your assistance next to you. And so we do need to put on our oxygen mask and we need to find that self-care for ourselves because it's really going to affect our students, our children that we're with. It's really, um, it's thinking about the brain, right? We need to like calm our emotional brain before we get back to our thinking brain. So when we're in the stress response, the amygdala, it fires through fight, flight, and flee, fight, flight, and freeze. And then we like flip our lid. We can't even access that prefrontal cortex in the moment, which is our problem solving and our rational mind. And so when we are kind of, um, think about that five point scale, and maybe our children are at a four or five, and then it's natural for us to go up there too. I have a 22 year old and a 24 year old, I know. Um, and that just happens naturally, right? And so we're feeling our heart pounding, we're getting a little sweaty, and we're up to a four or five, and it's like you're kind of doing this because nobody's in their thinking brain. Our amygdala is firing, it's kind of taken over, it's hijacked our, our brain. And so what we can do is co-regulate, which means we can breathe, we can pause, we can step away, we can listen to music, whatever we need to do to help bring ourselves back down right, long, slow exhale, and then hopefully their nervous system matches ours, right, and then when we're both back down to like a one or even a two, we're able to problem solve again, we're able to hear each other, we're able to have a rational conversation. And so I talk about the brain because I think as far as a parenting situation goes, if we can kind of lower that and know that words dysregulate. So instead of lecturing, instead of trying to teach something in that moment, it's better for us to just try to calm ourselves and wait and give our child some space so that we can process when they're calm.
it's going to go a long way. I think about that teacher in Charlie Brown's, like, if you're trying to talk to them, all they're going to hear is wah, 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 right? And the other analogy I think about is if I was at the end of a pier and I saw somebody drowning, is that the time to teach them to swim? No. We feel like we get like that. So if we're at a five out of five on that stress response, or there, our child is, we can't teach them skills in that moment. But we can teach them skills when they're calm, we can problem solve, and we can talk to them when they're, we're both in a calm space. To me, this is why I talk about the brain. Um, we all know that we have physical symptoms of stress that allow us to be aware that we're in that state. So again, it's physiological. We can feel that our face gets hot, our jaw might get tense, my shoulders kind of go up to my ears, I hold a lot of tension in there. We can get stomach aches, headaches, right? And so those are signs that, oops, like I'm starting to get in, under some stress, it's time to stop and do something about this. Um, with our children, um, behavior sometimes is communication, um, especially with the younger ones. Will, we might see like argumentative behavior, tantrums, depending on the age, just lots of argument, uh, argumentative kind of conversations, trouble sleeping, trouble eating, stomach aches, headaches. But what's underneath that? It's like this iceberg. What's underneath that? It could be anxiety, could be depression, sadness, guilt, shame, all sorts of things, lagging skills, things they don't know how to do yet. And so we know that these things, the stress over time can develop into anxiety. So chronic stress that's being untreated can be turn into worry. And again, Mallory did a great job talking about those ruminating thoughts that pop in. I can call them automatic negative thoughts a lot, ants. And so we want to squish the ants. And we can do that by really working and challenging our negative thoughts, reframing them, right? And a lot of times they are irrational. Sometimes we just get these intruding thoughts that don't even make sense. Um, and so we know that, oops, sorry. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. So we know there's external behavior, external symptoms of depression that we can see, and then there's internal anxiety. And so that's the part of that shaken soda can. We don't see what's inside that. And I've talked with a lot of teachers in schools, and somebody that I've been working with that I know has anxiety, and then they say they don't look anxious. And that's because a lot of times we don't see it. Right? And, but there are physiological signs that they might exhibit and the shaking or, you know, just kind of, you know how that feeling when you feel your body shaking? You might also have that perfectionism, the kids that are afraid to make mistakes. Um, and so there's all different ways that anxiety can come out. Just like depression, um, the big, you know, I think they do go hand in hand because anxiety is exhausting. And then over time, it's like I have lost my energy to do anything and I might isolate and I might show, again, very similar kind of external behaviors and internal behaviors. Um, and so what happens, though, is that a lot of times these kiddos that I'm working with are in their rooms, spending a lot of time alone in their bedrooms. They're losing interest in friends, losing interest in things that they used to like to do. Um, just they don't have the energy to do it anymore. And that, you know, that seems to be some of the signs that we see early on that makes sense. Um, so trauma, right, there's, it's different for everybody, and we, we're talking about trauma differently these days. I mean, we all have trauma, and so there's different kinds of trauma, and it impacts us all in different ways. And again, like, there's things that we see on the outside, there's different feelings we have on the inside. And I don't feel like we have too much time for me to go into, you know, I'm not going to read the slides for you, but I think Mallory did a great job explaining sort of some different ways that this shows up. Um, I think the big, the big difference and thing that we should know is that when all of a sudden you see a difference in your children, you know, get curious. Um, sometimes we know that this depression can cause self-harm, which again, it's not because they're trying to hurt themselves. Sometimes they're just trying to, it's like a negative coping strategy in a sense. It's like they're trying a way to see if it would make them feel better, um, see if there's some other way that could help. And a lot of times these things make it worse, right? And it's helpful if we can talk about it, right? I think as parents, we wanna to try to get them help because we have this umbrella of self-harm that we know. And there's, you know, again, the things that might be causing it are the anxiety, the stress, the depression, trauma. And then, you know, there's non-suicidal um, self-injury, you know, pulling your hair, cutting. Um, scratching, biting, hair pulling, pinching, all of those things can be 
not that they're trying to hurt themselves, it's non-suicidal. And then there's other ones that are really more risky behaviors, right, that is part of it. And it can be really confusing. And so I think this is a time where you know you need to reach out and get some help, um, particularly if, again, if your child has lost interest in things they normally do, if they've lost friends that they normally have, they're isolating, and then you see some self-injury in addition to that, you know, I would reach out to the school counselors, your pediatricians, um, you know, find an outside therapist, because you can't be alone with this either. It's really scary and hard as parents to know how to help. Um, and so, again, we know that people aren't wanting to die, they just want the pain to go away with suicide. And so Mallory did a great job talking about that. We know that it's not gonna make somebody um, try to end their life by suicide by talking about it. If you have any concerns or you hear your child saying certain things, you know, don't be afraid to talk about it with them. It's not going to cause them to try anything. It's important so they feel heard and understood. Um, so, you know, there's just, just some different things they might say or feel or do, and sometimes they will make a plan, and so, like, you can talk to a professional around assessing what they need. And so hopefully they're already in therapy, and the therapist can work with you around do they need to be hospitalized, can we create a safety plan, can we do something to help support them in this if it's really escalated. Again, I wouldn't want to be alone with that. I wouldn't be afraid to ask for some help. Um, and so what you can say is, you know, tell me more. I understand it's hard to talk about this. I wish it, you know, wasn't true. Um, it sounds like you're in tremendous pain and can't see a way out. Um, maybe you're wondering how life got this complicated and you must really, really be hurting inside to even consider ending your life. These are some statements that we can say. So when the way we speak, the way we connect, I mean, it's really important. We know that connection and community are key for mental health. And so we can do a lot by really listening, right, and talking to our children and talking to them about, um, you know, how do I show them that I hear them? We put down our phones, our technology. We can be present. And when I think about mindfulness, I think about it as being in the present moment, right? We're not thinking about the past. We're not worrying about the future. We're just bringing our attention back to the here and now. And sometimes that is putting down away the distractions. I had a, I had a child I worked with who said, uh, I am so loud because my mom never looks at me. She's looking at her screen on her computer all the time, and that's why I'm loud. And I was like, well, good. Like, thanks for telling us, right? Because a lot of times we couldn't figure out what was going on. And that was the mother was really surprised because she hadn't even realized that was his perception. Obviously, she wasn't always on her screen. But if we want to pause and, you know, just really look our child in the eyes and just, you know, it's hard for them to kind of talk about their day. And I find at night before bed is when, you know, when we get quiet and things kind of settle, that's when kids are more open to kind of talking. Um, when my son started driving, I thought that was so great. Like he used to have a hard time when I'd pick him up from school and he, you know, he was like a lot of kids. Um, stereotypically, I hear that about boys more, but you know, it is a stereotype, but every time I'd pick him up, he'd be like, it's good, good day, you know? And then later on, he would tell me more. And I find that helps when he started driving, because they're not looking at you in the eyes, and sometimes that is easier, and just being in the car and chatting, or going for a walk, or doing something can help kids to open up. And I think that we know that we want to try to keep an open mind. So if they say something, like sometimes we'll say, oh, don't feel that way or don't do that. Like we want to try to stay open, be reflective, let them know we hear them, reflect back what we heard. Um, so, you know, it's those kind of things that we know validating is so important. Kids want to be validated. And as somebody who's a counselor, it was really hard for me to validate my own kids somehow because I wanted to fix it. It's like painful to see your kids in pain, right? And so I wanted to be like, ah, oh, let's problem solve this or let's fix it. And my daughter got really good at saying, mom, I just want you to listen. Like, don't fix it. I just want you to listen. So a lot of times I will say, like, do you want to just vent? Or, like, do you need some help? Is there, do you, what kind of, how can I support you? And just asking because they often can tell us what they need. But they just, right, you know how you feel sometimes. You feel, you process and feel better after you vent. You're processing as you're, you're communicating. Sometimes we just need somebody to listen and to be there. So letting them know, you know, um, yeah, I don't, I would feel the same way. Like, I know how you feel. Like, 
right? And I statements too, like I feel blank when, right? Instead of like saying to our kids, like you make me so mad. It's kind of like, well, I feel really frustrated when you keep throwing the towel on the floor every day. And I'm asking like, can we work at putting that away? Even those simple requests. <laughs> Or asking them, like, what do we have to do next instead of telling them? I mean, there's, there's lots of ways to communicate that can really be helpful and just kind of being mindful of that. Um, it, can be, it can be hard. <laughs> so um, what we're trying to do is build resilience, right? Again, like resilience to me isn't that we're going to get rid of the stress. It's that we're going to be able to bounce back from adversity, that we can handle what comes our way. A lot of the kids and ourselves, think about it, the things that we feel like we are having a hard time coping with or the things that elicit that stress response like fight, flight, or freeze, those are the things that we often feel like we can't handle. And the things we feel like we can't handle, we get this sort of like block. And so what we're trying to do is work with those negative thoughts and say, I can handle this, I can do this, I'm capable and like we kind of plow forward we find that inner strength somehow and we teach those skills to our kids and we model that and they watch us and so how we can build resilience and how they can build resilience through our self-care right showing that we're taking time for ourselves to find things that we enjoy doing um, and again self-care doesn't have to be we're going to go get a massage or you know go get our nails done it's really just for me it's taking a walk outside in nature um, you know, taking some time to just do my yoga and meditation or just, you know, even five minutes throughout the day to just pause and breathe. Um, but there's so many ways like cooking or, you know, if, thinking about things that you like. You know, so I don't know, that self-care is really important to figure out. Like if I had to do one really good thing for myself every day, what would it be? And we can wake up and feel gratitude for, you know, like today I woke up, I was like, wow, the sun's shining in New England. Like, that's pretty great. <laughs> it's not been shining very much lately. Um, so one of the things I tell students a lot is that, like, we have certain things we can control and then a lot we can't control. And so if we can focus on the things that we feel like we can control, that's going to go a long way. So I have kids that talk about siblings a lot that they're not getting along with. And so what can you control with your sibling, right? Like, if, would it be possible to walk away instead of yelling at them? And is it possible to, like, just not argue back? Or is it, you know, and, and so once they change their behavior, sometimes their sibling's behavior changes too. But we can't help it if our sibling doesn't stop when we tell them to stop. They probably won't, right? Like, we keep saying stop and stop and stop, and stop right? And then it becomes a broken record. So it's just helpful for them to understand, like, I only can help what I do. And think about yourself, that's true. And when we're in school with friends, like, sometimes we're worried what other people are thinking about us. But we can just think about our own actions and how we communicate in the world. And that's the part that feels empowering. I think that has been really helpful for kids and students that I work with. Um, so I wanted to just, I know I'm going through this quickly. I hope, how's everybody doing with this? Um, so grounding is something that I wanted to spend a little time on because when we're having a stress response, whether we're having a panic attack, you know, our hearts are pounding, we're sweating, it's hard to breathe, grounding can be really helpful because it brings us back to the here and now. It brings us into this space out of our head. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. Like first, if you wanna just maybe do some of these with me, cause we're, all, you know, we're almost out of time and we might as, we've been sitting a long time. So feel your feet on the floor. Sometimes I'll say is imagine there's roots growing out of the soles of your feet, right? And then you're focused on the soles of your feet and you're not focused on all those spiraling thoughts. And then belly breathing is really help, like important because there's so many students I work with that say, I don't like breathing. It doesn't help me. Like when people say, take a breath. Well, that's because when we're panicked, we're breathing in our chest and we could even hyperventilate. So the belly breathing is like, if you want to try that, you can put one hand on your belly, and then as you breathe in, your belly fills with breath like a balloon and it presses against your hand. And then as you breathe out, your belly button goes back down towards your spine, right? And so you, it takes practice. I tell kids you can lay in your bed. For little ones, they could put stuffed animals on their stomach and watch it go up and down. 
for us or our teens, they can put a pillow and just really practice it. Again, proactively, not when they're drowning, right? But when they just feel good, like a little every day, we can practice noticing how does that feel to breathe in. Belly fills with breath like a balloon. And then as we exhale, the belly goes back down. Um, and progressive body relaxation is another really good one because we can carry tension in our bodies and we don't recognize it if we don't stop and think about it. And so all the tension from the stress, right, can get that chronic um, pain even. And so what we can do is like tighten every part of our body. So feel if you want to do it now, just we'll do it every single part at once, like tighten your face, your fingers, your hands, make fists, your toes, everything's tight, you breathe in. And then as you breathe out, you do it really slowly, relax each part of your body, right? So you can do that before you leave the house or before you go to bed, or you can listen to a meditation, and I have some apps at the end of this, where you tighten and relax each part of your body one at a time, starting with your toes, working all the way up to your face. And this can be good because it's active. And again, it's not like sitting like, in lotus position for an hour just going oh right it's it's feels like it's easier i think just like walking walking you can be walking and be mindful you can be outside you can notice what you see what you hear what you feel what you smell right you're all the senses you can feel your feet on the ground that counts as mindfulness all of that and so this five four three two one it doesn't matter what order you do it in you can do this for yourself if you feel panicky or highly stressed you can do it with your child so you know you look around and say five things you can see does anyone want to call out what you see <laughs> what else do we see mm -hmm. what else uh-huh awesome yeah Four things you hear. I don't know if we'll hear that much. Let's listen. Mm -hmm. I hear the fan on the computer. You might hear your stomach rumbling if you haven't had dinner yet. <laughs> How about three things that you feel? So it could be like your soft fabric. could be this annoying tag. It could be the temperature in the room. You could also just practice moving, right, circles with your hands or your feet. So three things you can move. How about two things you smell? Do you smell anything? We're kind of going through the senses. If you don't and you are your child too, you can carry essential oil with you, like lavender is very relaxing. You know, mint or even fruit like orange or lemon can be very stimulating and alerting, kind of wake you up. It's nice to have that you could roll it on if you're not allergic to that. Um, you know, smells, you could have gum and mint, so then you're getting the smell and the taste at the same time. And I work a lot with kids who struggle, you know, struggle with focus, so like gum and mints can help us to focus too on homework. <laughs> so these are an example, you know, it doesn't matter if you leave here and say, I forget which one was five for, it doesn't matter. It's just going through the senses. And there's other ways that I like to do this too, is um, you can look around the room for colors. So like we go through, you know, what do we see that's red, all the chairs? What do we see that's orange? What's yellow, right? And we can kind of go through. And so again, if you're, you or your child is having a really hard time, just getting them to think about something else can really lower that five, four, three, two, one on the scale and can help pretty quickly. I find the same thing with um, the category games. So like name all the different dog breeds that you can and you go through. And so you're really like using that prefrontal cortex. So it's getting us out of the amygdala, the stress brain, and it's getting us into that thinking brain, which is really helpful. So doing that with your kids can be great to kind of shift them. It can also be a good break in between homework and it gets them in that thinking brain and hopefully ready to get some homework done. Um, I have a picture of a mindful doodle here. Um, I did this with my daughter when she was home. She was stuck at, you know, home for COVID. She was really like kind of like losing her mind doing like everything online for school. She hadn't, she was a freshman. She hadn't even met anybody. Like she's taking classes like, ugh. <laughs> so I was like, come out here. We're going to do this mindful doodle. And so again, no words. We listen to some music. You draw a little circle. You separate the circle in parts. Um, and then you look around the room because it's a mindfulness activity and you notice the shapes you see, the patterns, the colors. We just did black on this one. And then you just take some time and doodle. There's no perfection. There's no right or wrong. And so these are other things that can be really helpful to kind of reset. Does that make sense? And I have... Um, 
the four, seven, eight breath, that's one of my favorites where you breathe in for four. Again, you breathe into your belly. So you breathe in, hold it for seven, and then long, slow exhale for eight. And you can blow out like you're blowing out a candle. This has been proven to help with sleep and high stress and anxiety. So four, seven, eight. Breathe in for four, pause for seven, and breathe out long and slow for eight. So you can teach this to your kids. You can practice this for yourselves. Um, these are just, this is another thing I do with kids that's fun is the breath drawing. So you breathe in, your hand kind of goes up on the paper, you breathe out, your hand goes down. So it looks like a wave or it can look like mountains. And so, and then you can color the spaces in between. I know we're almost out of time, um, but you know, using art, using clay, you know, if you have somebody that you're with that's really stressed out, just quietly drawing with them or using clay and just being present without words can really help de-escalate. And again, they feel your presence, you're with them without having to solve anything. Um, practicing self-compassion for yourself, the way you speak to yourself matters, right? And we're modeling that for our kids and also teaching our kids that we work with or that are our own children, you know, how do we talk to ourselves like we would a good friend? And I have this little thing I do that's a little finger tap and you can come up with your own little mantra. So like, let it be enough or I am enough today or, you know, I can do this. So it's, it's great if you find your own that works because again, we can talk ourselves out of things thinking like we can't do this and so just reminding ourselves we can um, and knowing that when we try new things, it can be really scary, but we can really find those passions, those things that we love, which is really important to have purpose. And we can also tolerate the mistakes and, and know that we grow from mistakes. And this is like something I say in my office constantly, right? Persistence pays off, practice makes progress, we learn from mistakes because I think a lot of kids are perfectionistic. They put so much pressure on themselves. So we know building community is so important um, and helping them to find things that they like to do and just sampling different things, supportive family, friends. And don't forget, right, like you, your interaction, your connection, your community is so, it's gonna help each child so much. You make such a positive difference every day. Um, and I, I want to give you some resources. Um, there's a resource I love called Insight Timer. It's a free app. Um, I listen to my bedtime meditations every single night. Um, I like Yoga Nidra. It's called N-I-D-R-A. It's like sleep yoga. <laughs> so it's really boring. It takes you through different levels of your brain waves, and it puts me to sleep all the time. So I recommend that. I have my own that I recorded on Insight Timer. So if you felt like um, getting the app, and you can look me up as a teacher, Linda Rose Price. You'll see my one Yoga Nidra. I'll be putting another one up at some point. Um, and, and then there's um, Calm and Headspace. Um, a lot of teenagers really like Headspace. Um, there's also Netflix that has a Headspace um, series. It's about, there's eight different like little clips. They're about 20 minutes long. The first 10 minutes explains mindfulness and the second 10 minutes is practicing it. And it's animated and I did it again with my daughter when she stuck home COVID when she was in college and she really liked it. I would say middle school and on up. Um, and then we know that yoga with Adrian is a great way to practice yoga at home if you ever were curious and she has some short ones like yoga for stress or anxiety or depression. They might be 20 minutes. And if you have little kids, cosmic kids yoga, they love. Um, and then we have our websites here, mindingyourmind.org. And mine is Linda, I mean, sorry, wellnessempowerment.care. Um, you can find me on Instagram. I do try to post um, different inspiring or just different strategies. And so that's wellness.empowerment. That's my business. Um, and so here are some resources. I think probably the best place to find therapists are psychology today. Um, but also you can call your insurance companies and get a list of different therapists that are in network, which can be so helpful. Again, talking to the pediatricians or school counselors, usually they have people they know that they can recommend, um, and just different, you know, religious groups. Um, I like that, you know, this is a long list of resources. Feel free to take pictures if you wanted, but 988 is a really, like Mallory said, is a really great one in the United States. They have shortened that for us so we can call or text. 
Um, and so if you want to use your phones, you can use this and then there's handouts or you can go to the mindingyourmind.org website and they have handouts for parents and educators and it's um, different information. So, um, so hopefully that was helpful. I, um, I finished right at 7.30 because I didn't want to keep you because I know your time is so valuable um, and it's been a long day for everybody, I'm sure. So I really appreciate you coming tonight. Um, we'll be here for you know, a few minutes. If you have any questions, feel free to come up. Um, or if you want to ask now, that's great. But um, I want people to know that they can leave um, if you need to. So we thank you. Have a great night. <laughs>